Amen. That's not really the kind of giants, dragons, and unicorns I'm talking about. That's more like it. That's more like it. Real giants, because I believe in them. And you'd be surprised at how, how much God has woven the idea of dragons, unicorns, the giants into Bible doctrine. And I found out yesterday Bible prophecy. I saw something I never saw. I mentioned it on Pastor Mark Online yesterday. Saw something yesterday morning I never saw before. And uh, so I'm going to try to share that with you tonight. Uh, first Timothy. Now, here's what, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. If you want to keep up in your Bible, go for it. I may move through some of these fairly fast, but I may not. But I always like it when God's people will open up their Bible. Okay? Or, like Ron and Sandy here, they always got a notebook and they got a pen ready. And they're taking notes, all right? And um, you guys know me by reputation. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures, okay? And so, what we're going to... And the theme this weekend is giant dragons and unicorns. And I just thought about that. And I thought it would be... I thought it would be unique in a way... But as I began to study it, I realized just how important this is because there up on the screen, 1 Timothy 1, you go ahead and turn there. When we believe the Bible, we, we don't get to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we believe and what parts we don't believe. This is not a cafeteria where you get to decide what parts of the Bible are right and which parts aren't right. And believe it or not, we are living in a day where it's ever increasing in churches and amongst people who call themselves Christians that they would say that parts of the Bible are not true or parts are based upon myth or fables or otherwise. I've even heard people say that the parables were fables. That's not true. The parables were things that when Jesus said there was a certain rich man, he didn't make that story up. He didn't just think about and invent something and try to tell it. If Jesus said there was a certain rich man, then I believe Jesus knew that certain rich man. He knew that story. He was familiar with it. And he was telling what he knew. If that's not the case then Jesus is become a false witness to us. If we were to put Jesus up on the, the witness stand in a courtroom, in a courtroom, you're not supposed to tell lies. You're not supposed to tell stories that you invented. You're supposed to tell what you know. And that's the limit of it. A court, a judge, a jury, lawyers, they're not interested in what your opinion is. They're not interested in what your theory is. They're interested only in facts. And so if Jesus gets up and he says there was a certain rich man and a lawyer questions him and says, Jesus, did that story true? Did that? No, that's a parable. That's a fable. I made that up. But it illustrates a really good point. I don't believe we ought to tell a lie to try to tell the truth. Amen. So when it comes to, let's say, when it comes to unicorns, now, uh, that version there of a unicorn is not true. It's not correct. And I don't remember if I mentioned this yesterday or not, but what has, what came out in my study is when I study the scriptures and the scripture version of unicorns, and then when I look at the popular idea of unicorns, I see two different things. This is sort of like a feminized version. If you don't mind me saying that, ladies. I mean, pink and purple are sort of girly colors. Amen? Kind of. I mean, a guy would never paint his bathroom pink and purple. Mossy oak, maybe. But not pink and purple. But the Bible version of unicorns is exactly the opposite of that. It's a very masculine, it talks about the unicorn's strength. It talks about his power. 
Those are like masculine ideas. And so the world has just kind of flipped this thing around. So when we talk about these things, we're not talking about fables. First Timothy 1. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, then I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. So what Paul's establishing, he's telling Timothy. Timothy is in the ministry, he's, he's, he's a bishop here. Paul then is instructing him on how to run his ministry. And he says... Don't give heed to fables. Don't teach fables. Don't tell stories that are not true. If you tell, if you talk to your people, just give them the truth. I mean, look at what he says here. Don't give something that just ministers questions. Give something that edifies godliness to those people. Gives them faith. That's what you're to do in that church. Tell them the truth. They'll thank you for it in the end. Amen. So don't give heed to fables. Don't just Endless genealogies and don't minister questions to people. Give them the truth. Titus 1.14, not giving heed to Jewish fables. Who remembers um, Honey the Circle Maker? Ever heard of that? Okay. Guy named Mark Batterson, I think is his name. Pastors of church there in Washington, D.C. He read a story. A Jewish myth about a man in the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew, a man that supposedly had bold faith with God and he drew a circle in the ground and he stood there and he said, God, I'm not leaving this circle until you make it rain. Now, I mean, it's, I guess maybe it's a nice story and I guess it's something about, you know, standing up to God or whatever, but it's not true. It's a myth. It's a Jewish fable but it went all over the world. Of course, this guy got rich and he got famous and he has everybody drawing circles and saying, God, you have to do this for me because I drew a circle in it. The story is not true, can't be proven to be true, but they're supposedly telling you something right about God based upon something that's not true. I can't do that. You shouldn't do it. No church should do it. God doesn't do it. If God said there were unicorns, there were unicorns. Just believe it. Amen. Science might catch up to God one of these days. If they're smart. If they're smart. So not, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that do what? That turn from the truth. Because if what you're teaching is based upon a myth or a fable or a legend or a lie... At some point, people are not going to believe you anymore. Or what you imparted to them is not going to last very long. It's not going to be permanent. It's only going to be temporary. Second Peter 1 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and Lion, Witch in a Wardrobe and all that nonsense. They're trying to tell me that that lion is Jesus. I don't believe that. I do not believe that. Um, I've read some C.S. Lewis things when I was in high school and college, and um, I'm not going to pick the man's life apart. I just don't believe, I think if he was going to write about God, he should have just wrote about God and said some things that were true. We've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so there he mentions the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lewis, Tolkien, and others, they, uh, I mentioned this the other day, J.R.R. Tolkien took C.S. Lewis, brought him over to his house, and he said, I'm going to introduce you to Jesus, but I'm going to teach it to you by way of Mithras, and Dionysus, and Bacchus, and Apollo, and Quetzalcoatl, and all of these, all these mythological gods that everybody has believed in throughout the centuries that we know are not true. And yet, Tolkien felt that they taught a Jesus-like story. And so that's what he told to C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis ended up believing that. And I'm just saying that if we're going to talk about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, why don't we just read the scriptures 
and talk about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we have to make up fables? Why do we have to make up fairy tales and myths and legends and things like that? Just give them the word of God. And so when people look in the Bible, some people want to pick apart the Bible, especially our King James. Because in these newer translations, they will try to update language like what you see where it talks about giants, dragons, and unicorns. They'll try to update that language to make it, quote unquote, more believable. Because some people may read the King James and not believe it because it talks about giants in there. Well, why not believe that? When the Bible weaves into the story of the giants the truth about our salvation. So why not believe it? Why not believe these things that are given to us in the scriptures? 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And he's talking about the things that happen in the Old Testament, the things that happen in the Bible. Did Moses really part the Red Sea? Did that really happen? Well, sure it did. You saw it on film. Right? I mean, you saw the movie. I watched it happen. Okay? No, we really believe that Moses really led the people to the edge of the Red Sea. He stuck the rod out, parted that Red Sea, and those Israelites walked across on dry ground. It was not, as I heard in Bible college, a marshy area where the tide went out and it left some, you know, not much water there. I don't know what is a greater miracle than for Moses to part, let's say, a hundred feet of water and the people walk across on dry ground, or as the scholars say, they just walked across in a marshy area and Pharaoh's army drowned in three inches of water. I mean, what, you pick your, pick your miracle here, but something happened. But I just believe, I believe what the Bible says. They were our examples. They're teaching us something that is not only relevant to the time that we're living today, but they are relevant, I believe, concerning what is going to happen. And there is something about unicorns that I read yesterday that I went, I never saw that before. And it's prophecy. It's going to happen. Not has happened, it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hebrews 10, 7, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. To do thy will, O God. Jesus here talking about his coming into the earth. And he said, everything that's in the Bible is written of me. And I'm going to do it the way God said so in his book. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. The thing that hath been. There it is. There's your key right there. Why do we study the giants? What do we think is going to happen in the last days with mankind? With the rise of an antichrist. What do we think is going to take place that pertains to what the Bible says about dragons? What the Bible says about giants? Is, are they related? Is there something relevant there? The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And in Ecclesiastes 1, he's talking about, this is where he talks about the cycles. He said, all the rivers run into the sea. If you go over here tomorrow afternoon after we get done, drive over here to the Mississippi. And say hello and goodbye to that water. Because if you hang around here a few months, it's the same water that you see going down the river. You're going to see it again in about three or four months. It runs down to the Gulf of Mexico. That hot air, that hot sun down in the Gulf of Mexico picks that moisture up. Brings it right back over the Midwest. It's a lot more humid here than it is in Las Vegas. Amen? A lot more humid. It can be 110 out there, but it's a dry heat, right? Here, it's just sticky and stinky, right? But that's that moisture dumps back on the ground, runs right back into the Mississippi River, right back in the Gulf of Mexico, and it starts all over again. Same water. Somebody said this. How old is that water? That water is 6,000 years old. Same water. Same water, 6,000 years old. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done 
is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So when I really caught a hold of that, I mean, I was taught a little bit of it in Bible college, but they kind of taught it like, yeah, there's a few examples in scripture of typology, but don't make too much of it. But then when I'm reading the Bible, I'm seeing the types, the shadows. I'm seeing the stream of time running again. These things that you're reading in the Bible, if you are looking for what is going to happen, all you got to do is look back in here and find out what already happened. These things are going to come to pass one of these days. And let me run through these. These are all out. Of the, I love the book of Psalms. Uh, this is, I just typed in the word truth and from the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, I'm going to just kind of run through these very quickly because the point, the point of everything I do is your Bible's right. So y'all can go ahead and go back home now because the Bible's right and that's it. Y'all go and I'll eat all that good barbecue we got. Did you see the bags of it down there? It's good, John. Psalm 25, 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony. See, when you're right with God, you don't have a problem reading this Bible and believing it. You may not understand it. You may think, God, that's a little weird, but you said it was right, so I believe it's right. But when you're in covenant with God... You just don't have an issue whether or not the Bible's right or not. Psalm 31, 5, into thine hand I commit my spirit. Who said that? Well, I did just now, but Jesus did too. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Wow. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. That means... God doesn't do anything or say anything or teach anything that's not really true. God never does that. Uh, Psalm 40, I've not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I've not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. That's y'all. You're the great congregation. God has declared to you his faithfulness. His salvation, His righteousness, his, He's not concealed His loving kindness to you, amen? And His truth to you. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Because sometimes we just need to open the Bible up so that we'll know that we're still in God's hands. You ever had those days? Sometimes you think, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm good enough to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. You open the Bible up and God continually preserves you when he reveals his loving kindness and his truth to you. He lets you know that yes, you are abiding in his love and his favor. Psalm 61, he shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. There it is again. Psalm 85, 11, truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Now that just, that stuck to me, okay? Where does a spring come from? It comes from out of the earth. Where does rain come from? Down from heaven. Now, the waters that came in the days of Noah, that came down from heaven, Will, they came up from the earth, right? So look, look at this verse now in that light. Truth shall spring out of the earth, Righteousness shall look down from heaven. Jesus, the Paul said that Jesus cleanses and purifies the church with the water by the word of God. So the word of God is water that Jesus uses to cleanse and purify us. So what did God do with the flood? He purified the earth. He washed this earth clean because all flesh had corrupted its way man was corrupt there were giants everywhere there's no telling what else was going on in the earth at that time but it was so corrupt and so vile 
that God said, I need, it needs to be cleansed, it needs to be purified. And so the water that came down from heaven and the water that came up from the earth, what I see in Psalm 85, 11 is that represents God's word that came down and came up and it purified and cleansed the earth. So when Noah and his family walk off to onto the earth, God was, God was gracious enough, if I may, He was gracious enough to extend Noah's time on the earth so that all the corruption was over with. All the bodies that were decaying, by the time a year rolls around, that's all pretty much over with. So when Noah comes off the ark with his family, he's not walking off into a stinky, smelly mess everywhere. All the corruption had already taken place. The earth had been cleansed and purified. And now he's walking off into a clean world. Take note of that. Because when you got saved, that's what God did. He washed you with the water of his word. They shall spring out of the earth. They shall look down from heaven. They came down from heaven. It came up from the earth. And God purified you and cleaned you. So when you're saved, you're clean. God's a clean God. Amen. He is a clean God. Uh, Psalm 100, verse 5. The Lord is good. Somebody say amen. amen. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endureth to the original manuscripts. That's what it says right there. Original manu... Right? Oh. To all... See my little red light there? Isn't it, isn't it cool? To all... You don't see a red light? Yeah, there it is. Right there. Follow the bouncing ball, everybody. Okay? It endureth to all generations. God did not say that He only preserved original manuscripts. God did not say that it used to be pure. God said it would be pure for all generations. Psalm 117, for his merciful kindness is great toward us and the tr already, truth of the Lord endureth forever. Psalm 119, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Verse 43, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth for I have hope in thy judgments. And you know me when, it, when, when you're talking with people, give them scripture. Let that, he said, take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. If you, don't, if you don't have the Word of God to give them, you're not giving them much. If you're going to talk to people, if you're going to help people, let Scripture come out of you. That means study this Word and get enough of it in you so you got enough of it to give out. Amen? Uh, verse 142, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. There is no other truth. Uh, brother Jason Cooley, uh, uh, he, we kind of share things back and forth every now and then. And he's telling me there's a man that he used to be on Sermon Audio and Sermon Audio got tired of him and they kicked him out. His name is Scott Johnson. He's a chiropractor and uh, he, is, uh, he is full of poison. Full of poison. Uh, he has gone full-blown Mandela effect. And he's, he's reaching a lot of people and impacting a lot of people. And uh, Jason sent me his latest newsletter and it is full of things that his followers have written into him thanking him for sharing the truth of the Mandela effect that somebody flipped a switch at CERN and opened up a portal, went back in time, turned over some dominoes, and hocus pocus, now words in the King James Bible are gone, they're missing, or they have been changed into something else. That's a lie. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible lie. It's, it's one of the dumbest lies. I mean, think about how unrealistic this is. They're wanting you to believe. This man who says he knows God, knows all about the Bible, this man wants you to believe that somebody time-traveled went back in time, somehow changed words in the King James Version of the Bible, and now we're in a different timeline than we would have been, and we have this memory of how the Bible used to sound, but it doesn't sound that way anymore, because somebody changed it. 
That's stupid. That's watching too much Star Trek. Don't ask me how I know that. But that's what that is. That is one of the dumbest things I've heard in a long time. That in a earth. Amen, John? John's a pilot. You can't pilot a flat earth with round earth navigation tools. Can't do it. But anyway, he's spreading this, he's spreading this stuff all over the place. He is somebody that supposedly champions the King James Version. And he tells everybody, boy, now's the time to get in your Bible. Why? You're telling me they've changed it. Yeah. My point is this. What else do we have left to trust? Most of us have been on a journey through life where we've been lied to. We've been deceived. We've gone from this to this, we found out that wasn't true. We went over to this over here, found out that wasn't true. And we were like, to whom shall we go? There is no other place to go. If my Bible is wrong, I don't have anything else that I trust. If my Bible's wrong, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. We may die. And, who, and so who cares, right? My goodness. So the law is the truth, singular, and there is nothing else in this universe that is true other than this Bible right here. Amen? Even if it does say unicorns. Psalm 119, 151, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. All of them. Every one of them. Psalm 138, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Amen. You underline that verse in your Bible. Mark that down. Make you a bumper sticker. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. You know what taking God's name in vain tasted like to me? Soap. I got my mouth washed out with a bar of soap for taking the Lord's name in vain. For my mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Proverbs 16, 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. There you go. When you're not doing so well, get your Bible out. Get your Bible out, read it. Let God purge your iniquity with some mercy and some truth. Amen. It's one thing for you to say, God, I'm sorry for what I did and God to have mercy. But God is not only in the sin forgiving business. God is in the sinner transformation business as well. His desire is to not just keep forgiving you of what you're doing wrong. His desire is to change you so you don't do it wrong anymore. Amen. It's his mercy and his truth. Both of them are necessary to purge our iniquity. Uh, and, uh, for, uh, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. How true is that? Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose name... In fact, turn to Psalm 146. Let's spend a little time here. Psalm 146. Verse 5. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help. Whose hope is in the Lord is God, not the Mandela effect. Not in YouTube videos. Amen. Which, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth for how long? Forever, he said. Which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners, not loseth, he looseth them. He sets them free. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. How many of you used to be that way? Say amen. God opened your eyes. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth how? 
That's your group that believes the Mandela effect. They've got it all upside down, don't they? Okay? God's telling you a little bit about their nature and their character. Okay? Now, I, I listen, I, I'm, I'm a friend to those who get sucked in by all these things coming out over the internet. You, you, you can get lulled in a little bit and think, oh my goodness, did they really change the Bible? But then you're supposed to get back in the Bible and say, no, God said they could never change it. Okay? And, and so, you know, I understand slipping up every now and then. But when you just go whole hog telling everybody that some evil thing went and altered the words of a book that God said are not alterable. And then, and see, he's been approached. Scott Johnson has been approached by people who were telling him, please, brother, look into this and pray about this because this is not right. And all he does is slam them. Anybody who dares says that he's wrong about anything, boy, they get it. Okay? He's a very arrogant person, and he's never wrong. And somebody like that, you're just not going to reason with. So somebody who's just fixated on stupid stuff like that, and they can't be fixed, they can't be changed, there's something in them that's upside down. You know what they're doing? They're calling God a liar. And they're saying that this light is now darkness. And they would call darkness light. And there's something wrong with somebody like that. Amen. Proverbs 22, that I might... We're going to get to the unicorns in a little bit. So everybody calm down. That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. That thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. You know the words of truth. And you answer the words of truth. That means somebody asks you questions, you say, well, let's see what old King James says. Amen? Let's see, let's see what Ezekiel had to say. What did Matthew have to say about that? What did Paul say about that? Ecclesiastes 12.10. Here we go, preachers. All of my preacher friends, those men of God, the preachers sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even the words of God. Truth. Preachers. If any preacher is listening to me. When you start looking for stuff to preach on. Get your Bible out. Read it. You'll find all kinds of things to preach on in this book. You won't need sermonillustrations.com. You won't need to buy downloaded messages that somebody else wrote that you don't know who that was. You won't need to make up stories and and parables and little poems and things like that. What you'll have is a whole book full of things to say. Just give them the words of the words of truth. Amen. Uh, Daniel ten twenty one. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. John eight thirty two. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, not set you free. I'll climb over that pew. What's the difference? Opening the canary cage is setting the canary free. Grabbing the canary and throwing him outside, that's making him free. Amen. Let's hope there ain't a cat sitting out there waiting for him. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When you say you have the Holy Spirit in you, then you must have the word of God in you as well. You cannot separate the two. Sancti John 17, 17, Sancti underline this in your Bible. John 17, 17, because Pilate asked the question. What is truth? What is truth? Pontius Pilate, he didn't know what the truth was. He was looking at the way, the truth, and the life. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So, the Bible's right in everything that it says. 
including when it talks about unicorns. Amen? Turn to Numbers 23. Now we're going to get into the unicorns. Numbers 23, um, verse 23, has a historical background. Numbers 23, 23 is a famous verse in history, aside from being in the Bible. Does anybody know what, how this verse, Numbers 23, 23, is famous? Anybody know? Didn't y'all go to school? Ron, didn't you go to school? Okay. It's been a, lot, it's been a while, hasn't it? Nobody knows this. Nobody remembers this. Spencer, don't you know this? Maybe the Mandela of it. <laughs> when the lightning strikes, I'm going to be over here. What hath God wrought? Doesn't anybody know that? It was the first electronic message ever sent in history. No. Morse, who invented Morse code and the telegraph, the very first message he sent was, What hath God wrought. I thought surely somebody would know that. My ham operator. I thought my ham operator would know that. Only a nerd would know that. I'll take it. No, really, that was uh, Samuel F. B. Morse. The very first to 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 show what he had made. The very first. Message sent by Morse code was a verse out of the King James Bible, and it was Numbers twenty three twenty three. What hath God wrought? Where did He send it? I don't know. He hadn't got an answer yet. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember that part. Numbers twenty three twenty. This is Balaam and, and Balak, right? Behold, I've received commandment to bless, and He hath blessed. I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity. In Jacob. Now, think about that. Had Israel sinned? Yes. But God had not beheld iniquity. That means the sins of Jacob had been forgiven. And God sees, just like you tonight, God sees you without iniquity. Boy, you think about that. Amen. He sees you without iniquity. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. That's be King Jesus, amen, or King James, one of the two. But God hath brought them out of Egypt. Now notice this. This is, when we're looking at the unicorn, this is what we're being taught here by the scriptures. God hath brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. Now, the Bible, God is the one who's equating God's strength with a creature. If this creature doesn't exist, then that says nothing about God's power. It's like, oh, he's got the strength of a unicorn. Yeah, uh -huh. unicorns, they don't exist, right? But they do. Surely there was no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what hath God wrought? So you, you think about this. He hath the strength of a unicorn. No magic, no divination, no witchcraft. All the powers of hell itself cannot prevail against Israel nor the God of Israel. Because he hath the strength of an unicorn. Somebody say amen. Now that's not this unicorn. <laughs> that was cute. Or this one. Steve brought me that. I don't, I guess that's what they eat up in upstate New York. Me. 
I asked him, did he look on the back? Look, look at, I'm going to tell you something. Now you just, I see blasphemy. Because look at this. It says, seeing a unicorn in the wild will bring you good luck. Right there. And then, watch this. Look at this. Unicorns can cleanse water with the touch of their horn. Unicorns can heal whatever troubles you. A unicorn always knows when you're telling the truth. We've gotten a long way away from the scriptures, haven't we? Now, some people ridicule us for making, oh, you're making too much of this, and you, you, you stupid people believe in unicorns anyway. So, But let me tell you something. When, God's, when people believe the Bible, stuff like this, they don't go for it. Okay, I don't trust in little magical fairy rainbow girly unicorns. I trust in a God whose strength is like that. Now that is the Siberian unicorn. The skeletal remains they have dug up. At one time, the scientists were saying that this lived... 100,000 years ago or whatever, and that no man ever walked with unicorns. Now, we know from the Bible that cannot be true because the, the earth is not 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 years old. So did man walk with these creatures? Well, if we, read, if we just read our Bible, we will say yes, because why then would Balaam be saying anything about a unicorn if they didn't even know what they were or they were just they were just dreamed up why would he say anything about the strength of unicorn if they didn't have first-hand knowledge and so according to the bible people knew what these creatures were they saw them the scientific name of this is elasmotherium sibiricum but it's basically it's the siberian unicorn they found that the skeletal remains they found are in the siberia region but there is, of course, evidence now that, number one, they were wrong about their date of when these creatures lived. And number two, they've expanded the area that they now believe that these creatures roamed. It wasn't just in Siberia. It was a lot of Europe on down into the Middle East. But imagine just imagine you walking out into a field and this thing is staring you down. That horn is over six feet long. That horn is as tall as I am. Okay? I like that picture there, that guy running from that thing. That's not real. Okay? Uh, none of these exist so far. So far. Okay? Uh, here is... The rough estimate of, uh, of the Siberian unicorn compared to a six-foot-tall person. Uh, let's see here. What are the dimensions here? 15 feet tall, 20 feet long, weighed over 9,000 pounds. The horn length was about six and a half feet. Okay, about, about that big around at its base. Now, just for the creature to be able to lift that up on a daily basis you know he's got some good roast meat in his neck okay something worth eating so that verse again when you think about this creature now how big it is this is not the lucky charms version of the unicorn this is the real bible version of the unicorn god has brought him forth out of egypt he had as it were the strength of a unicorn now, when you see that, you can see that the Bible was talking about God's strength. And buddy, that is a lot of power packed into one animal. That is a lot of strength. All right. Let's look at what else. Oh, by the way, I found this. I, I mean, I, I tried to do as much research on this as I could. I spent a lot of time. This is a book printed in 1886. It's called Unnatural History or Myths of Ancient Science, being a collection of curious uh, curious tracks on the unicorn, the phoenix, behemoth, leviathan, the dragon, and other 
things. And here's what this book said. 1886. We have authority of the most unimpeachable authorities for saying that it, the Siberian unicorn, is an inhabitant of the wilds of Ethiopia and India. Louis Vertomanus of Bologna, whom Scaliger speaks of as an excellent man in his 205th Discursus, whatever book that is, saw two unicorns at Mecca, which he says were sent over by the prince of Ethiopia as the means of cementing a closer friendship with the sultan. In other words, we have eyewitness testimony of people who actually saw these creatures alive. He said, there is also in Fredericksburg, the finest fortified town of the king of Denmark, a unicorn's horn, seven feet in length. And with the girth of seven inches, my hand is about eight inches. So at its base, it is about as big as the length of my hand. It is a conspicuous object and has been described by D. Thomas Bartholinus. Um, uh, let's see here. Ulysses Aldrovandus, a man of the widest reading in his discussions on quadrupeds, says, quote, I have seen at Rome two unicorn's horns, one which belonged to Pope Clement VII, and another which was the property of my own nephew, the very famous Prince Peter, Cardinal Aldrovandus, and etc. So this, whoever wrote this book had eyewitness testimony. Number one, of someone who said they had seen one, and actually described a transaction that took place with somebody in Mecca. And then, of course, eyewitness testimony of people that had actually seen the horn of a unicorn. And the description of that horn matched what the scientists have dug up and have actually found to be true. That the horn is about six and a half to seven feet in length. It's about eight inches at its base, not some little twisty little white horn on a horse, okay? This is a big horn from a big creature. So we have, and by the way, this on the left is an artist's rendering. On the right is a cave painting from France of a unicorn. So you have... In essence, the ancient times version of a photograph of a unicorn. The closest thing to a photograph they had some four or five thousand years ago was they drew this thing and it was huge. So you have the Bible now. For years, people ridiculed the King James Version because it said the word unicorn Saying that obviously it's talking about a rhinoceros. A rhinoceros is not a unicorn. A rhinoceros has more than one horn. So it cannot be a unicorn. Ridiculing the King James because these creatures never existed. Now we've dug the bones up. Now we have the evidence all over the place. Now they even have, have changed the times when these things lived to where they said they could have coexisted with man at his earliest stages. So now they're changing the story. But the Bible was right the whole time. While science falsely so-called was in a state of flux, changing everything. Now they've come back around to saying, yeah, there was this creature that I guess could match for that. Deuteronomy 33, verse 16. And for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Now, when the Bible talks about the horns of somebody, now, of course, we don't have horns. But the word horn, uh, Matthew used to do this. We'd be driving down the road, the sun would be shining through clouds. And it hits the clouds and it separates the light rays out and these big light rays are coming out of these clouds in different ways. Horns coming out of these clouds. And Matthew would say, Dad, that's God's power, isn't it? And I'm going, yeah, that's pretty good for a kid. 
Now, I don't know what he had in his mind, but he was right. That was the glory of the Lord in the cloud with these rays of sunlight coming out. Those are the horns of sunlight peeking through those clouds. That's how the language was used. When it talks about a person having horns, I think it's referring to like when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, his face is shining so bright, rays of light are beaming from his face. Those are the horns of his glory. Does that make sense to everybody? So look at that. Look at that now with that in mind. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. When they're in the same verse, that's the Bible's way of identifying and defining what that means. So it says his glory, then it says his horns. So what it's saying here is that the glory of Joseph is tremendous because his horns, his glory is coming off of him like the horn of a unicorn. And remember, the horn of a unicorn is as big as I am. That's a lot, amen, for one animal to have on its head. That is, that is a huge amount. And when, so when God is talking about his glory, man, his glory is bright. And with them, look at this, with them, he shall push the people together. Now, the, the meaning of a horn in the Bible is like how animals use horns. They use them to get their way. Bullfights, right? When the bull fights the man in the arena, he does not use his paws, right? He uses his, and with his horns, he gets his way. Every year in November, the buck deer go in rut. What that means is, all the does better start running because the bucks are coming looking for them. And if a buck deer sees another buck deer, that buck deer's had it. Okay, a couple years ago, me and Matthew and Caleb went deer hunting. Matthew shot a buck. He had part of his horns tore off, ripped off. I shot a buck, big effect that's hanging in my office. And I said, Matthew looks like my buck got to your buck. <laughs> when they fight each other, they use their horns. They use their horns to get their way. Rams, goats, anything with a horn, deer, anything with a horn, that's what it means. When the unicorn is out in the field and you walk out into that field, all of a sudden you're going, this field must belong to that unicorn. Because you're not about to take it over. Amen? He's going to use that horn and he's going to get his way. So look at that. With them, he shall push the people together together. To the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim. And they are the thousands of Manasseh. Do you think if God's power is like the strength of a unicorn. Do you think God has any problem getting his way? Absolutely not. There it is. Job 39. Turn there. Oh I like this. Job 39, 9. Will the, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? In other words, they didn't use unicorns like they did oxen and mules and donkeys. They used oxen. They could take two oxen and yoke them together and get them to plow a field. They could take a mule Strap him to a plow and get that mule to plow a field. Giving the mule instructions all the way. And the mule would just do what he was told to do. But can you imagine you trying to be the boss of a unicorn? There were no successful unicorn trainers back in these days. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? Or abide by thy crib? Would you buy your child... A pet unicorn that was going to grow to be 20 feet long, 15 feet tall, and have a horn six and a half to seven feet long. No. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? You know what a furrow is? It's that line you make in the dirt when you plow it up. 
That's your furrows. So can, canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Can you strap a plow onto a unicorn? Will he harrow the valleys after thee? Will he plow the fields up for you? Will he do that for you? What God is saying here is he's telling Job, Job, I want you to think about this. So Job obviously knew unicorns. He knew them. He knew what kind of creatures they were. He knew what they were like. He knew their strength. And he obviously knew that there were no successful unicorn tamers. There was always a circus looking for a new unicorn tamer. After they had the funeral of the last unicorn tamer. But no unicorn tamers. They're just a creature that cannot be tamed by man. And that's what he's saying to Job. Canst thou bind a unicorn with his band? You're going to get him to plow your field, Job? Is that what you're going to do? Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? You don't use unicorns as farm animals. animals. You don't do that. God is teaching Job certain things using questions that Job obviously knew the answer to. But the idea here is that unicorns are beasts that man don't have control over. I want you to remember that. Okay? Because we're going to see something that's going to raise a question in your mind. Psalm 29.5 the voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Have you ever seen those cedars of Lebanon? They're huge. We grow a lot of cedars here in Missouri. In fact, in fact, we was telling Tracy and them that if you leave a field fallow in Missouri, it's going to be overrun by cedars. Okay? And there's several out by where we live that at one time... Farmers own those fields and now they're just lying fallow and cedars just take it over. I mean, that's just what happens. And, uh, but some of those in Lebanon especially, well, California, um, what am I thinking of? Those big trees in California? Redwoods. Okay. How big and tall are those? Okay. The Bible's saying that God could speak and snap them in half. Um... What am I trying to think of? Mount St. Helens. Remember Mount St. Helens? 1980? All of those trees just blown down by the power of that mountain exploding. Knocking those trees just plumb over. Okay? The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars, yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. Now, apparently, a young unicorn is like a young calf. They like to dance. You ever seen the young calf dance around, skip around, kick around a little bit? Apparently, young unicorns like to do the same thing. And then it said in verse 7, the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. Well, remember in Acts chapter 2, what did they see over the heads of all those that were speaking in tongues? Divided flames of fire. There were cloven tongues like as if fire sitting upon each one of them as they were speaking in those tongues. Now, Psalm 92. Turn there. Psalm 92, verse 8. But thou, Lord, art most high forever. That means that when Lucifer says, I will be like the most high, he won't quite make it. Amen. Because I'm not about to worship Lucifer. Amen? Not going to do it. So God is the most high God and he's the most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn, remember, your horn is the glory that God puts on you. My horn Shalt thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. What that means is, and you listen. Everybody here, everybody watching, everybody listening to me. The devil attacks you, does he not? 
How many would raise your hand and say the devil did everything he could to try to keep us from coming here this weekend? And you live here. Man. Yeah. He'll try to get at you. He'll try to stop you. But remember this verse. Number one, you believe in unicorns. Amen? You believe in unicorns. And you believe the Bible when it says that God will exalt your horn like the horn of a unicorn. What that means is what the devil tells you to do, you don't have to do it anymore. You have power now that you didn't have back in the day. You know, the day back when you were doing all your stuff back in that day when you were living for the devil, doing everything. For, and when the devil said jump, you jumped. When the devil said drink, you drank. When the devil said lust, you lusted. When the devil said curse, you cursed. When the devil said shoot up, you shot up. When the devil said get violent with somebody, you got violent with somebody. You don't have to do that anymore. God has made your horn, your influence, your power like the horn of a unicorn. The most soft-spoken person in this room has influence and power that maybe you're not aware of. Now, I'm not one of these that just, go, just says you can go around and just knock devils down right and left and no thunder can ever get victory over you and you're going to live a dominant life the rest of your life and nothing can ever touch you because I don't believe that. Every dog has his day. There's a time and a season for everything. There's a time for standing and a time for falling. And I understand all about that. But I can tell you this. There's been times when I got tired of the devil walking on me. God exalted my horn like the horn of a unicorn. And I stood up and I said, I've had enough, devil. Back away from me. Get away from my family. Get away from my church. Get out. Amen? Amen? You have that. God will give you that power, that strength. And again, you can be the meekest, soft-spoken person in the world. Moses was one of the most meekest men in the world. But God chose him to lead the people of Israel almost into the promised land. Don't ever think that you're not smart enough. Your voice is not strong enough. You're not quick enough or whatever to be able to influence somebody that you love, somebody that you know, somebody that you care about. Don't ever think that you have to always sit and keep your mouth shut because they're not going to listen to you. God will exalt your horn just like the horn of a unicorn. Somebody, And what do we say that horn was all about? I'm getting my way. I've had enough. And I'm telling you, this is going to go my way or it's not going down. Amen. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. My not. You know what fresh oil is? Reading a new place in the Bible. That's fresh oil. Amen. Let's see. What did I read yesterday? Well, I'll read something else today. That's fresh oil. Amen. Or read it again and get something else out of it. Fresh oil. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes shall, shall also shall see my desire on mine enemies. Who's your enemies? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Wouldn't you like to see your real desire on your enemies? You want them destroyed, don't you? God's going to do it. God's going to do it, people. He shall, you shall see your desire on your enemies. Mine, eye, mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me because you've got the horn of a unicorn don't ever forget that amen isaiah 34 turn there here we go this is it when i read this Now, I'm going to say this. 
I have no idea what this means. And some of you drove 30 hours to get here. Oh, to hear me say, I have no idea what this means. You're going to find out what I'm saying here in a minute. Isaiah 34, 2. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. And his fury upon all their army, armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Now, that is speaking in a future sense. Even though the armies haven't even been raised up yet, God said they're already slaughtered. Amen. That's confidence. That is confidence. And there's nothing wrong. I'm all about meekness and showing biblical Christian meekness in almost every situation. But that doesn't mean that you have to think that every situation you're in is going to be a hopeless lost cause simply because you're not running your mouth. Okay? God's, God already gives you victory in many places and in many ways. You already have that victory. Their slain also shall be, see that's future tense, shall be cast out. And their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Now, verse 4 is an interesting passage because it's speaking of the event that we see taking place in Revelation 6 at the opening of the sixth seal. If, in fact, if you want to hold your place there and turn to Revelation 6 very quickly, you'll see what I'm talking about. Revelation 6, uh, the Bible says, uh, verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Do you believe that one? Oh, surely that's just, uh, that's just metaphor. That's, that's just spiritual, symbolic talk, right? No, those stars are going to fall. The stars of heaven fall into the earth, even as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Think about Pentecost. What did they hear? Mighty wind. And the heaven departed as the scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Well, now look at Isaiah 34 again. Verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. So Isaiah 34 matches Revelation 6 and the opening of the sixth seal. So this is an event that is yet to happen. Has everybody got that so far? Okay. That's to me is what makes it interesting. We're not just reading about something that used to be that we didn't see. We're reading about something now that's going to be that we might be able to see. We might live long enough to see this. So all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. The heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down. As the leaf falleth from off the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. And that's what he said in Revelation 6. It's like a fig tree shaken of an, of an un, uh, losing her untimely figs. Verse 5, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made with fat, it is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Verse 7, do you believe in unicorns? Do they exist right now? There are none. Now, I've never seen one. I go to the St. Louis has a great zoo. Next time you come into town, go to St. Louis Zoo. Most of it's free. It's a great zoo. But I've never seen a unicorn at the zoo. So I think it's safe to say right now there are no unicorns. But look at that verse. What's the next word after unicorns? What does that mean? That means it's going to happen. So, rest of the world, if you're watching, not only are we the people that believe in unicorns, we believe that they shall appear again. Look at that verse. The unicorns shall come down with them. And the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Now, I have no idea what it means. But 
According to this, there's going to be unicorns again. According to the word of the Lord. So this, this is where our faith comes in. Do we believe the Bible? Yes. Do we believe every bit of it? Yes. Do we understand it all? No, but I believe it. Now, God obviously knows what he means here, right? So I'm going to let God worry about it. But I have an article I'm going to show you. Someone will eventually use CRISPR to try to make a dragon or... Dun, dun, dun. I need my sound effects up here. Dun, dun, dun. And this article, I've read this article before, and this guy makes a case for somebody, he's, he's basically just telling it like it is. Now that we know how to read DNA, and now that we can very easily and cheaply rewrite DNA. I mean, teenagers can buy a kit for 30 bucks, and learn how to rewrite the DNA of a one-celled organism in their room next to their Iron Man poster. That's how easily it's done now. If it's done that easily, Spencer, what's keeping North Korea from rewriting the DNA of a virus that only attacks white middle-class people in America and kills them all. What's keeping Iran and Syria from making an Ebola virus that only kills Jews? Because all you got to do is program the virus to look for the DNA that matches those of Jews and when it finds a Jew it kills them but if it's not a Jew they don't die because the people in Iran and Syria they hate the Jews and they would love to rid the land of Palestine of all the Jews wouldn't they they'd love to kill every one of them what's keeping nations of the world from building soldiers number one that don't have a conscience don't have a conscience don't react to pain that are stronger tall taller taller what's to keep since we know according to the Bible that the unicorn was an animal that could not be tamed what's to keep some nation somewhere from building, getting soft tissue. So let's say that since these are in Siberia, they dig up these woolly mammoths in Siberia all the time with most of their body somewhat intact. We actually have the DNA of woolly mammoths and they are right now trying to recreate the species. This is not science fiction. I know I've not been watching too much television. This is now science. What's to say they'll find the soft tissue of the unicorns, reinvigorate the species, bring them back, okay, and make an army out of them? I don't know. I don't know what all of this means. I just know that in the CRISPR age, anything goes now. There isn't any species or any kind of creature that man can dream up that man can't make now. It's not going to be too hard for him to figure out how to do it. Because the tools are already there. And we're living in the dragon, giant, unicorn age. Do you believe it? Amen. Now tomorrow. Ooh, I like this one. Psalm 22. I like this one. I like... Now here's... In fact, open to Psalm 22. And I'm going I'm to close it out with with this possibility. Psalm 22 is 
about the crucifixion of our Lord. David got it right, right down to the very words that Jesus was going to say on the cross, right down to the fact that the Roman soldiers were going to part his garments and cast lots for his clothes, right down to the fact that they were going to pierce, they were going to crucify him by piercing his hands and feet. That's in Psalm 22. Right down to the fact that they all stood at the base of the cross and mocked him. And then, let's read a little bit of this, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus said those exact words. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night season and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see, see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Now look at verse 12. Now remember, Psalm 22 is about what happened at the cross. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Who remembers that part in the Gospels where they were and when, on the cross of Jesus where the bulls showed up? I don't either. But according to this, the bulls showed up. Now, do we believe the Bible? So according to this, the bulls compassed him. What kind of bulls? Verse 13, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Were there any lions at the cross? According to this, there were. But what kind of lions? I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs compass me. Who remembers the story about the dogs at Calvary? There were no dogs. Well, there was, but what kind of dogs? They were not seen, but they were there. So what am I saying? What am I getting at? Spirits. See, we know in the Bible from Ezekiel 1 that some of the cherubs that were the chariot of God, part of them looked like bulls, part of it looked like lions. So we know now that there are spirits in the spiritual realm that look like bulls and lions. What is Satan? A roaring? Was he there at Calvary? So now do we believe also that there would have been dogs also at Calvary, not visible dogs, but spirits like dogs. You see what I'm saying? See what I'm getting at? Now, let's go down to verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from where? The unicorns were there too. That phrase, save me from the horns, or thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns, means that the horns of the unicorns, the unicorns were there rushing upon him and he cried out and God heard him from the horns of the unicorns and saved him just in time. That's what that means. Okay. So going back to Isaiah 34, the unicorns shall come down with them. So could it be that there are spirits in the angelic realm that are unicorns. And these spirits have an immense amount of influence in the events that go on in this world. How easy is that to believe? 
I mean, we're wrestling principalities. We're wrestling powers. We're wrestling the rulers of the darkness of this world, and we're wrestling spiritual wickedness in high places. And according, I think the Bible is like a trail guide to the beasts that you and I encounter every single day. So maybe now in your life, you could start taking note of the influences around you that are about as strong an influence as a unicorn would be. Spirits that love to get, in fact, spirits that pretty much get their way. Do you know somebody, very evil person, that whenever they're around, everything is done the way they want it done? I'm not talking about your mother-in-law. Or maybe I am. I love you, Gloria. Maybe you know somebody that has a spirit that is so strong and powerful that they always get their way. Maybe that spirit is a unicorn. Dun, dun, dun. So do we believe in unicorns? Do we believe that they existed? Can we also say that in the spiritual realm, more than likely, some of these beasts that we deal with are unicorns? Makes sense now, doesn't it? Okay? Aren't you glad you believe the Bible? Amen? So tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, dragons. Dragons. Okay? Now, I know several years ago I taught on dragons. I'm not going to recover most of that. I'm going to touch on a little bit some of the things we've already learned about dragons and giants. So I tried to, when I put this together, I tried to approach it from a completely different way. But it may end up sounding like what I've already said, but that's okay. Okay? Because it, it'll help us to hear these things once again. Do you believe in dragons? The one in particular that we're most in fear of. He's real. He is a spirit and he's real. And he's very mean, amen? And his mouth is full of poison.